reading through the Bible in one year. May 16th, Numbers 25, Psalm 68, Isaiah 15, and 1 Peter chapter 3. And Israel remained at Shittim, and the people uh, began to play the harlot with the daughters of Moab. This is an important thing to read through and understand what's actually happening. I'm going to read the note here from the ESV Study Bible, because it does a good job of explaining it. And I referred to it a couple, three days ago, kind of giving a background to what it is uh, and how it relates to, um, to Balaam. But it's good to read through and understand kind of what's happening. So let's begin. The apostasy at Peor. Balaam had delivered his final oracles at Peor in chapter 23, verse 28. Now, at the foot of the mountain where Balaam had been prophesying, the Israelites start whoring with the daughters of Moab and sacrificing to their gods. This, sorry, the juxtaposition could not be more stark between the exuberant visions of Israel's future and their uh, present blatant infidelity to the law and the covenant. But this sort of inconsistency was not new. The same thing had happened at Sinai, while Moses was being given instructions on the building of the tabernacle. The people were making and worshipping the golden calf, Exodus 25-34. through And at Kadesh, the wonderful prospect of entry to the land was dashed by national unbelief, at Numbers 13-14. through these earlier episodes were, rather, are alluded to here in chapter 25, and various details in this apostasy parallel earlier ones, uh, the plagues, the consecration of the, Le- of the Levites and priests. What's missing here is the threat to destroy the whole nation or delay the entry to Canaan. God's plan is going to be um, implemented despite Israel's unfaithfulness. As Deuteronomy 9, uh, verse 5 puts it, not because of your unrighteous, sorry, not because of your righteousness are you going in to possess their land, but because of the wickedness of these nations, that he may confirm the word that the Lord swore to your fathers. Let's begin. Starting again at verse 1. And Israel remained at Shittim, and the people began to play the harlot, play the whore, with the daughters of Moab. Indeed, they called the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel joined themselves to Baal, or Baal, of Peor. And the anger of Yahweh burned against Israel. And Yahweh said to Moses, Take all who are the heads of the people and execute them in broad daylight before Yahweh so that the burning anger of Yahweh may turn, from, or may turn away from Israel. So Moses said to the judges of Israel, Each of you, kill his men who have joined themselves to Baal of Peor. The same thing happened, this is referring to what we just read, the same thing happened with the Levites when they were supposed to go through and kill people. So Moses said to the judges of Israel, I already said that, verse 3, 6, I can't math. Then behold, One of the sons of Israel came and brought near to his brothers a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the sons of Israel while they were weeping at the doorway of the tent of meeting. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, saw it. So he arose from the midst of the congregation and took a spear in his hand. And he went after the man of Israel into the tent and pierced both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman, through the body. Then the plague on the sons of Israel was checked, and those who died by the plague was 24,000. Then Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, has turned away my wrath from the sons of Israel, in that he was jealous with my jealousy among them, so that I did not consume the sons of Israel in my jealousy. Therefore say, Behold, I give him my covenant of peace, and it shall be for him and his seed after him, a covenant of perpetual priesthood, because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the sons of Israel. Now, the name of the slain man of Israel who was slain with the Midianite woman was Zimri, or Zimri, the son of Salu, a leader of the father's household among the Simeonites. 
and the name of the Midianite woman who was struck down was Cosby, or Cosby, the daughter of Zur, who was a head of the people of a father's household in Midian. Then Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Be hostile to the Midianites and strike them, for they have been hostile to you with their deceptive tricks, with, uh, with which they have deceived you in the affair of Peor, and in the affair of Cosby, or Cosby, the daughter of the leader of Midian, their sister, who was slain on the day of the plague because of Peor. That's all the notes to hear. Let's move on to Psalm 68. Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Let those who hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As, ma- uh, sorry, as wax melts before the fire, so let the wicked perish before God. But let the righteous be glad. Let them exalt before God and let them rejoice with gladness. Sing to God. Sing praises to his name. Lift up a song for him who rides through the deserts, whose name is Yah, and exalt before him. A father of the fatherless and a judge uh, before the widows is God in his holy habitation. God causes the lonely to inhabit a home. He leads out the prisoners into into prosperity. Only the rebellious dwell in a parched land. O God, when you went forth before your people, when you marched through the wasteland, Selah, the earth quaked. The heavens also dripped rain in the presence of God. Sinai itself quaked at the presence of God, the God of Israel. Again, Exodus chapter 20. You caused abundant rain to sprinkle down, O God. You established your inheritance when it was uh, parched. Your creatures inhabited it. You established it in your goodness for the poor, O God. The Lord gives the word. The women who proclaim the good news are a great host. Kings of armies retreat. They retreat. And she who remains at home will divide the spoil. And if your men lie down among the sheepfolds, you all would be like the wings of a dove covered with silver and its pinions with glistening uh, glistening gold. When the Almighty dispersed kings there, it was snowing in Zalman. A mountain of God is the mountain of Bashan. A mountain of many peaks is the mountain of Bashan. Why do you look with envy, O O mountains with many peaks? at the mountain which God has prized for his habitation. Surely Yahweh will dwell there forever. The chariots of God are are myriads, thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them as at Sinai in holiness. You have ascended on high. You have led captives. Or rather, you have led captive your captives. And you have received gifts among men, even among the rebellious also that Yah, God, may dwell there. Blessed be the Lord, who daily bears our burden, the God who is our salvation, Selah. God is to us a, a God of salvation, and to Yahweh the Lord belo- rather, and to Yahweh the Lord belong escapes from death. Surely God will crush the, the head of his enemies, the hairy skull of him who goes on in his guilty deeds. The Lord said, I will bring on, rather, I will bring them back from Bashan. I will bring them back from the depths of the sea, that your foot may crush them in blood. The tongue of your dogs may have its portion from your enemies. They have seen your procession, O God, the procession of my God, my King, into the sanctuary. The singers went on, the musicians after them, in the midst of the maidens beating tambourines, Bless God in the congregations, Yahweh, the fountain of Israel. There is Benjamin, the youngest, having dominion over them, the princes of Judah in their throng, the princes of Zebulun, the princes of Naphtali. Your God has commanded your strength. Show yourself strong, O God, who has worked on our behalf. Because of your temple at Jerusalem, kings will bring gifts to you. Rebuke the beast in the reeds, the herd of bulls with the calves of the people. 
trampling underfoot the pieces of silver, he has cast out the peoples who delight in war. Envoys will come out of Egypt. Ethiopia will stretch out her hands to God. Sing to God, O kingdoms of the earth. Sing praises to the Lord. Selah. To him who rides upon the highest heavens, which are from ancient times, behold, he gives forth his voice, a voice that is strong. Ascribe strength to God. His majesty is over Israel. His strength is in the skies. O God, you are awesome from your sanctuary. The God of Israel himself gives strength and might to the people. Blessed be God. Now Isaiah 15. The Oracle Concerning Moab Surely in a night Ar of Moab is destroyed and ruined. Surely in a night Kir of Moab is destroyed and ruined. They have gone up to the temple and to Debon, even to the high places to weep. Moab wails over Nebo and Medeba. Everyone's head is bald and every beard is cut off. In their streets they have girded themselves with sackcloth. On the rooftops and in their squares everyone is wailing, dissolving, rather dissolved in weeping. Heshbon and Aleah also cry out. Their voice is heard all the way to Jahaz. Therefore the armed men of Moab make a loud shout. His soul trembles within him. My heart cries out for Moab. Those who flee from her are, are as far as Zoar and Eglath Shalish. I always get this wrong. Eglath Shalishia. Shalishia? Shalishia. For they go up the ascent of Luhith weeping. Surely on the road to Horonaim they keep awake with crying in distress over their destruction. For the waters of Nimrim are desolate. Surely the grass is dried up. The tender grass has completely ceased. There is no green thing. Therefore the abundance they have made and stored up, they carry off over the brook of Abarim. So Arabim. For the cry has gone out for the territory of Moab. Its wailing goes as far as Eglaim, and its uh, wailing even to Beer Elam. For the waters of Demon are full of blood. Surely I will put added woes upon Demon, a lion upon those who, rather those of Moab who have escaped, and upon the remnant of the land. It's close today in 1 Peter chapter 3. Peter continues, In the same way, you wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives, as they observe your pure conduct with fear. Your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry and putting on garments, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible quality of a lowly and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. For in this way, in former times, the holy women also, who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves, being subject to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. You have become her children if you do good, not fearing any intimidation. You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with a weaker vessel, since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. Now, to sum up, all of you will be like-minded, sympathetic, brotherly, tender-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. For the one who desires life, to love and see good days, must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. 
for the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed, and do not fear uh, their fear, and do not be troubled. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account of the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and fear, having a good conscience, so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who disparage your good conduct in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better, if God should will it so, that you suffer for doing good than rather for doing wrong. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, so that he might bring you to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which also he went and made proclamation to the saints now in prison, who once were disobedient, when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah, during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, uh, were brought safely through the water. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. We'll talk about that. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal of, the, sorry, of a good conscience to God through the resurrection of Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone to heaven, after the angels, rather after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. Now, there are some very long notes in here. Um, the first one is on the spirits in prison point. Um, this is something that gets people very confused. So, I'm going to leave the notes here for you to be able to read those. I'm going to go ahead and scroll through those now. But the one I'm going to park on for a minute is the one that says that baptism now saves you. This is something that a lot of people get hung up on. And um, I'm going to go ahead and read the note both from the ESV Study Bible and the Reformation Study Bible, because it's good to see it from two different uh, sides, from the ESV Study Bible now. A comparison is drawn between salvation in the ark and baptism. In both instances, believers are saved through the waters of judgment since baptism portrays salvation through judgment. A mere mechanical act of baptism does not save. You're getting wet. Even if you go through all of the rites of baptism, and you, you know, everything is done perfectly, congratulations, you're getting wet. It's a symbolic thing you're going through. Let's continue on with the text. Uh, for Peter explicitly says, not as a removal of dirt from the body, meaning that, the passing of water over the body does not cleanse anyone. Baptism saves you because it represents an inward faith, as evidenced by one's appeal to God for the forgiveness of one's sins, quote, for a good conscience, unquote. Furthermore, baptism saves only insofar as it is grounded in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism is a, a visual representation of the fact that Christians are clothed with Christ, Galatians 3, 27. And in union with Christ, they share in his victory over, sorry, over sin. Though Christians have disagreed about the proper mode of water baptism, beginning in the early history of the church, Christians have generally agreed, irrespective of denominational differences, that water baptism is an outward sign of the inward reality of regeneration, which is the result of the work of the Holy Spirit, and which may be received only by grace through faith. Now from the Reformation Study Bible. Baptism is a sign and seal of God's grace in Jesus Christ. This text literally comes not only from Scripture, but also from the Westminster Confession. The startling statement that baptism saves you shows the closeness of the relationship between the sign and the reality it signifies. Noah's physical salvation through the waters of the flood prefigured the waters of baptism and the salvation they signify. Baptism symbolizes judgment on the sin, uh, 
sorry, judgment on sin in the death of Christ, and then also renewal of life as you're brought back up. The floodwaters were a judgment on the wicked, and at the same time, physical salvation for Noah and his family. The line here, not as a removal of dirt from the body, lest his readers mistakenly attribute a magical or mechanical power to the sacrament. Peter states that the means of salvation is not performance of the external rite, but what it symbolizes, union with Christ in his death and resurrection. Again, I've had um, even close family members who have believed that baptism actually saves a person. You could take your child and baptize them, and by so doing, they would be uh, either saved in that moment or marked by God. There's a, there's a, a yellow uh, pillar of light that shows up on them in the heavenly realms, and wherever they go, people will know that person is already saved. They just don't know it yet, as if the performative act of the parent is somehow saving that child down the road. I also know Presbyterians who have uh, been brought up within the Presbyterian denomination to believe exactly what the the WCF says, the Westminster Confession of Faith, that um, baptism is a sign and a seal of God's grace in Jesus Christ. And then they take that, and then they take the next line in the WCF that says that um, infants or children of any believing member, be it the father or the mother, must be baptized. They take those two things and they put them together. Well, they must be baptized, and baptism is a sign and seal of God's grace in Jesus Christ. Therefore, this baptism saves them. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but they're marked with this same golden pillar of light above them, so that Further down the road, God will save that person. This is not in the text. It's not in Scripture. It's an unscriptural, unbiblical idea. It doesn't exist. All that we see from a believer's baptism in, uh, you know, since, since the Church of Christ began is that those who believe, those who confess faith in Christ Jesus, those are the ones who are baptized. Yes, we see in Scripture that um, there certainly are times, especially in the book of Acts, where we read lines where it says that, you know, everyone in their household was baptized, and everyone believed. And I understand the statement that there had to be infants in this household, and it says Everyone, therefore, everyone was baptized and everyone was saved. But nowhere is it written that infants must be baptized, much less that the baptism saves you. It shows here, and we see that one line that baptism now saves you. We've already read what that means. It doesn't mean that the baptism is performing salvific work upon you, or that you, by submitting yourself to baptism, you weren't saved before, but now that you're doing the baptism, now you're a real Christian. We don't see that. What do we see? We see that Jesus commands that those who believe must be baptized. We see that when people are are baptized... It's because they're confessing that they no longer trust in themselves for their own salvation. That they lay their life and everything that they are at the feet of Christ. They remove their crown of of, of righteousness from their head that they were assembling, creating for themselves, and they throw it away. And they lay down at the feet of Christ and say, you be my righteousness. You be the one to save me. That's what they say. That's what scripture says. And that's all that it is. And that's what my, my brothers and sisters, my Reformed Baptist brother and sisters believe. The baptism is an outward sign of this, this inward reality. It's a, it's a rite that we go through 
to publicly declare uh, before our church that we believe that Jesus is our, sorry, is the Christ, is the Messiah. We believe that his work on the cross is both um, sufficient to cover all of our sins, past, present, and future, and also that it is efficient for us and that it has been applied to our lives. We reject our um, ability or, or desire to seek to save ourselves through performative actions and instead that we're trusting in Christ for all of those things on our behalf. And that we are bound with Christ in his death as we go into the water, and then his burial and resurrection as we rise back up. To be born again. It's a, it's a physical representation of what has already happened in you. And that's what we believe. That's what the text here is saying. Baptism, that which it represents, has saved us. It's an appeal of a good conscience to God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This same Christ. Remember, that's a messianic title, the Christ the Mashiach, the Messiah, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been, past tense, already subjected to him. That's all that it is. All right. That said, um, that is all of the text, and that is all the notes for today. So, God willing, we'll be back tomorrow.